Welcome to Capital Gains, Yahoo Finance's unique look at how U.S. government policy will affect your bottom line long after the presidential electoral polls have closed. Now, it's been a very busy week. We know we were thinking about October surprises last week, but there has been a lot going on. We're looking at the escalating conflict in the Middle East. We're looking at the aftermath of Hurricane Helene, the port strike on the East Coast, and of course, Tuesday night's vice presidential debate as well. And of course, we're just north of a month of being outside of these presidential elections. So how will all these current events impact the economy as well as the election? We're going to break it all down. And of course, later on, we're going to be hearing from Kyle Kondik, Sabato's crystal ball managing editor from the University of Virginia's Center for Politics to break it all down for us. So of course, have to bring in my co-stars, Ben Wershko and Rick Newman to see what they've been watching in a very busy start to October already. Um, ben, I'll have you kick things off. Sure. Yeah, you mentioned mentioned October surprises right off the start. That's that's what I'm focused on as well this week. It's you could make an argument that there are sort of three October surprises happening simultaneously. Around. You mentioned them: the hurricane, the growing conflict in the Middle East, as well as the port strike. All of those have been happening in the last three days, and it's only it's only October third. Um, I won't belabor each one. We can sort of do our own power rankings of those three. Um, a couple notes on the hurricane because I think that's sort of dominated the. The, at least the political, the the politicians' calendars this week. Trump was in Georgia. Kamala Harris was in Georgia, as well as at FEMA headquarters. That's not to mention Biden, who was in North, South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia this week. So this is really where they're focused. And this is this is because kind of hurricanes have a long history with presidential politics in, in big ways. It was eight years ago this month that Hurricane Sandy happened. And it was 12 years ago, excuse me, that, that Hurricane Sandy ha happened. And it was a that was a major moment in the, the at the end of that presidential campaign. And so you're seeing a lot of focus there and a lot of questions about sort of how does this change the last dynamics of the race? Rick, I'll let you tell me which one of the ones you think are important. I think we've now we have a new cliche. It's October surprise. I mean, every news uh, news story is, oh, wow, look at all these October surprises. And guess what? I, those three um, surprises, if they're even that surprising, they they happened like on the first day of October. It wasn't like an Octo <laughs> like the month of October surprise. It was like the October one surprise. So uh, you know, I don't know. Is there going to be an October two or three? Um, so my view of these, I, I think only one of these really um, it, it could have could affect the election directly, and it's what's happening in the Middle East. And even there, um, so as we're as we're recording this, uh, it, Israel has not retaliated ag against Iran for that uh, strike where. They sent almost 200 ballistic missiles uh, into Israel, um, but they are certainly going to uh, retaliate. And the question is, what are they going to do? And I think this only affects the U.S. election if something happens to oil and, and, and gasoline and energy prices. And I, my, my guess is that is it is not going to push oil or gasoline prices up by very much. Now, we have seen this little fear premium in the oil market. I think oil prices are up about 5% since uh, that Israeli, uh, excuse me, that Iranian attack on Israel. Um, that's not a huge jump, though. And oil prices are still in the low to mid 70s, which is quite manageable. So, you know, pump prices have been coming down, and that's clearly been a tailwind for Harris. I think the Biden administration, now we know that the, the Israel doesn't necessarily do what the Biden administration tells them to do. But on this one, I think uh, the White House is is probably really saying, whatever you do, don't um, don't strike Iranian oil facilities in a way that would affect their exports going onto the market. And it really is about exports. I mean, to keep this in mind, um, there are other things they could do to strike Iranian uh, energy infrastructure that would affect to, uh, domestic supply inside Iran of energy products. But uh, I'd be I'd be astonished if if Israel did anything that would affect the supply of oil to global markets. Um, the port strike, um, if this gets resolved in a month or so, I'd, I don't think it's going to be a, a huge factor. Um, if it goes on longer, it will start to cause some issues, some shortages and stuff like that. Um, and then for, as for the hurricane, Ben, you're right. I mean, there's always a hurricane. And I think, I, I mean, Joe Biden has has responded exactly as you would expect them to respond. There's going to be tons of aid continuing to flow to those states. At least two of those states are potential swing states, North Carolina and Georgia. So um, I, I like the fact that Biden doesn't, um, you know, he said, I'm going to wait until I'm sure I'm not, I'm going to be, out, I'm not going to interfere. You know, I'm not going to get so much in the way that a presidential visit is going to mess up rescue operations there. But he's been, he's been to the region. I think he'll go back and I think so will Kamala Harris. So we could still have some October surprises that are more, uh, that have more of an impact than these three. 
Mm. And I know that obviously you, you have the candidates on the campaign trail and they're weighing in on these things. But at the end of the day, what about Congress? Because a lot of people are sort of looking to place the sort of decision making in the public eye. But, what, but in terms of Congress, how should we be viewing that versus sort of the specific actions of the actual presidents or presidential candidates, Ben? Ben, what's on your note card what? on that one? Uh, I mean, in Congress, I think Congress is pretty absent right now. They're literally out of out of session. They're scheduled to be out of session until after the election. There's talk around the hurricanes that they might have to come back to provide supplemental. It seems like a low probability. But I think this is the stage where lawmakers don't want to be in Washington. They want to be campaigning themselves. And so it's going to take a lot for Congress to kind of insert itself in any way. They're they're eager to do this. And so I think more of the focus is going to be on on the presidential candidates and the president and Joe Biden and sort of how they respond to these as opposed to anything Congress can do in the short term. But after the election, it'll be able to change and they'll go back and they may so, uh, appropriate more money, things like that. But for right now, they're they're off the stage, at least on these issues. Can I talk can I talk about the other thing that's happened recently, uh, the, the vice presidential debate, if only for a second or two? Um, mm -hmm. My my uh, favorite um, review of the vice presidential debate was a one word review, forgettable. But um, I have one takeaway, which I thought um, um, Tim Walls was just underwhelming. Um, and there are some political analysts who think Kamala Harris made a big mistake by not picking Josh Shapiro, uh, which in theory would boost her odds of taking the crucial swing state of Pennsylvania. Um, if she wins Pennsylvania, then I think everybody will say, sure, Walls is fine. But, um, you know, I, I, I feel like more doubts came in about Tim Walls. He just he just looked unsteady. Um, and uh, not necessarily somebody you can imagine as president of the United States if he had to be. Um, but I think so few people will make decisions based on the vice presidential debate that it, it, it probably doesn't matter very much. Yeah, because I was wondering how much weight people would give to, give to the performances, because obviously you have, you know, Vance, he, he's, an, he's an attorney, you know, this, this, is, this is the sort of platform where you can essentially clean up some of the damage that was done um, in the debate between Trump and Harris. But I think people are also going to be looking for a lot of the rhetoric that comes from this. Some of them were like, is, is this the same Vance, this sort of very agreeable version that we've seen here? versus some of the rhetoric that we've heard on the campaign trail, some of it didn't quite match. It wasn't the strongest performance um, from Waltz. I mean, I think people were looking for that sort of, you know, picking up the baton from, uh, from Harris there. Didn't quite happen, had a couple of gaffes there as well. Traditionally, we usually don't put that much weight on VP debates, but because we know we likely aren't gonna get another presidential debate or another VP debate, this is really all people had to go on then. Yeah, and a couple couple additional points on that too. I do think there's an interesting divide between some of the kind of Twitter political expert reaction and some of the flash faults you see. I agree, Rick, that, and it was sort of my reaction too, watching it live, was that Walls was underperforming, especially at the beginning when he was he was clearly kind of nervous and and doing it. But when you look at some of the flash polls, a lot of it is a real wash, which kind of gets yeah. to the point of whether whether this matters at the end. But I think voters kind of tip that into account. And then there was moments at the end that I think will resonate more in Walls's favor. So, so, I, so I, the line I think is, is, is it, was a, it was a pretty big loss. So Ben, with your astute eyes and ears, I, I, Ben, thank God, is the guy who scrutinizes every word in every debate. Um, but you, yes. uh, uh, I think you wrote on this, um, that this oh, sure. shift yeah. in um, tone from, uh, you know, on behalf of the Trump administration about Obamacare. I mean, that's really, yeah. it's, oh, I it mean, was, it's ridiculous. It's, first of all, it's ridiculous it was, that yeah. J.D. Vance said um, Donald Trump salvaged Obamacare during his term. I mean, he, yeah. uh, he, bla he, he tried to kill it. I mean, he came within one right. vote of killing the whole thing. He tried to kill but, it consistently for four years in a row. <laughs> right. Uh, um, but... No, it's not. It's like now they're kind of like, yeah, we we've yeah. been behind it the whole time, and you know right. I've covered this too. I mean, um, the the ACA went from being very unpopular to being pretty darn popular. I mean, the approval rating for the ACA now is uh, it's around sixty five percent, and um, you you know you don't go around. Um, well, I guess Trump kind of does go around um, bashing things that happen to be popular. I mean, he's sort of doing he's sort of out of right. step on abortion. But um, I, I just think it's fascinating that we're seeing this it kind of wild. turnaround among amid, amid that. No, and it's the stats on it are pretty interesting about how there's 20 million people now in the country that have signed up for health insurance through the Obamacare exchanges. Yep. That's, so that's a significant number of people. That's 9 million people more than we're at the start of Biden terms. It's really grown over that period. And it, and it's, to your point, it sort of reflects the kind of more political reality here than any, than any 
sort of substantive shift on there. People, the Republicans realize that Obamacare is actually popular now and sort of they have to blur the lines a little bit. With yeah. And, and just to add to that, I mean, uh, uh, those are not all Democrats, those 20 million people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, the people who are getting health care through the ACA and, and you're just talking about through the through the federal marketplace. When you add um, people who are getting um, health care because the ACA expanded Medicaid, it's more like it goes from 20 million to more than 40 million. And there are still some mm-hmm. Republican states that have not that are not participating in that. So there are more people in Trump country who could be benefiting from the ACA if only their governors would sign up for it. So that, you know, it's t- going against the APA, a- a- ACA has turned out to be a political loser. And it's one of those things where either you vote for sort of your best interest when it comes to healthcare, or, I mean, you vote by party lines and potentially, you know, end up losing some of your health benefits. But we'll see if people vote on those kitchen table issues that, or, or the rhetoric that they do online versus what they actually do in those, in those voting booths. But we'll have to put a pin in it for now, but don't go away. More of Capital Gains continues after this break. Welcome back to Capital Gains. We're just over a month away from Election Day. And so we're looking up and down at the ballots there in this final sprint to the elections to really see what the current state of events looks like, not just after that VP debate, but as we edge closer to the election. So we're now joined by Kyle Kondik, Sabato's crystal ball managing editor from the University of Virginia Center for Politics, who is going to help us get through all of this. Thank you for joining us. So first, I want to set the stage because... A lot of people are wondering, you know, it it did seem to be a bit of a wash, some of that early polling. Has polling changed much since 2016, since 2020, where we're getting more accurate polling or at least better weighting so we can get a gauge and people aren't as surprised when they see the final results? I think pollsters have tried to correct some of the problems from the 2016 to 2020 polls, although it was striking that there actually was more polling error in 2020 than there was in 2016. It's just that it got glossed over because the poll suggested Biden would win, and he did, in fact, win. Um, but his the Democratic margins were more overstated, generally speaking, in 2020 than they were in 2016. There are a lot of different things going on. You know, uh, uh, Charles Franklin, who runs the uh, kind of the gold standard poll of Wisconsin, the Marquette uh, University Law School poll, um, he talked about how they used to divide the state into five different regions. Now they divide it into 90 different regions, I think, as a way to make sure they're, they're trying to capture all the nooks and crannies of the state, mm-hmm. including some of the you know, white rural areas that are very heavily pro-Trump. And maybe you're just not reaching the, the, the kind of people there that you need to get an accurate sample. Um, look, I think if you're if your baseline expectation and this was my baseline expectation is that this was going to be a close election. Well, that's what the polls are showing. And so the surprise would not be if Harris or Trump wins because the polls are suggesting that both of them have a path. The surprise would be as to whether one of them cracks it open and wins kind of going away. Um, And if that's the case, then there will have been probably some polling error either against Harris or against Trump. Kyle, I use your site all the time and it's free to the public. I, I, I recommend it. Uh, Center for Politics, you can find it. Um, your maps are great. Um, so like other forecasters, um, you've got seven swing states and they're all very, I mean, you've, you, you rate them as toss up, not uh, based on polling information, but lots of other stuff. What Do you have a sense for what is going to end up be, being the decisive factor in uh, a few of those crucial swing states or all of them? Or is it different, you know, one thing in this county, something else in another county? I think our elections are highly nationalized. And I think so things that might matter in, you know, in Nevada and Arizona probably also matter in, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. You know, you, you all mentioned the hurricane that it affected Georgia and particularly Western North Carolina. That is, I think, an X factor here. You know, you mentioned Hurricane Sandy earlier. Um, Obama actually performed pretty well in some places hit hard by that hurricane, uh, including winning uh, uh, a, a Richmond County, which is Staten Island, which is you know the, by far the most Republican part of New York City. Uh, there's some thought in hindsight that there might have been kind of a turnout disruption and maybe it seemed bluer than it actually is. But Donald Trump, of course, did well in Staten Island in both 2016 and 2020. Uh, I do wonder if, you know, we'll look back at what happens in North Carolina and say maybe there was some sort of electoral impact um, from the hurricane. You know, one positive thing, I mean, obviously, you know, the devastation in Western North Carolina seems just horrific. Um, but one of the reasons that we do have robust early and absentee voting in places is that if there is some sort of 
disruption um, that people are still able to vote. And, you know, that that's that, you know, that is a state in North Carolina where, where that is, um, you know, that, that, that is that is an option. But I'm just curious if there is some sort of effect, you know, it will sort of the story still being written as to whether people think that the response was good, both from local and state government and also from federal officials, whether there's a backlash against the incumbent administration, of course, the you know, the Biden. Harris administration in that case, you know, that is kind of a local factor that that is of interest. It's something we're watching, but it's also something that's kind of hard to quantify. Um, there are, you know, seven states I think you could really accurate, just accurately describe as toss-ups. You know, I do think of those, Michigan is probably the one that, that Harris, I think, is likeliest to carry, um, despite some weakness, I think, in the, you know, the kind of the, the, the widely talked about, although not particularly populous, you know, Arab American pockets around Detroit. Um, uh, there probably will be some weakness there for Harris, but I think she probably can make it up in other parts of the state. That also was the bluest of of these uh, seven states in in 2020. So Harris has a little more room, wiggle room in that state. Uh, you know, the polls have generally suggested that you know Georgia and Arizona might be leaning slightly toward Trump, although I think they're still again accurately described as toss ups. You know, and for all the talk of Pennsylvania, and of course it's super important. I think Trump has a credible path to win without Pennsylvania. I don't really think Harris does. Like, I, I think if Harris votes for Trump, I, I just don't think she's she's going to end up winning. Um, now, you could play with the math and, and figure out a way for her to do it. Um, but I think there's been so much focus on Pennsylvania that, you know, it's it sort of turned our attention away from the fact that Wisconsin usually votes a little bit less democratic than Pennsylvania does. Mm. And that's really important for Harris uh, a, as well. So, you know, again, these states are all um, really tight. You can maybe see a marginal favorite, maybe Harris in Michigan, maybe Trump in Georgia and Arizona. Uh, but again, they're all still really close. That, that's fascinating about, about, about Staten Island and the hurricane after that. I didn't realize that. That's I, that, that's a that's a really unpredictable element. Um, Carl, one, one ex-actor you didn't mention I'd love to get your thoughts on is the economy, inflation, cost of living. You know, do you think there's any room for movement there on that issue, especially at the presidential level, or are sort of views baked in there and so nothing can really change how voters view Harris or Trump on that? There's a belief from history that people form their opinions about the the economy kind of earlier in the year. Uh, and so, for instance, when George H.W. Bush lost in 1992, part of it was that there was this, I think there was kind of this like post-Cold War malaise, but also there were some bad perceptions of the economy. And actually the economy kind of picked up throughout 1992, but maybe too late for it to really help Bush. If you go back way you know, further back in history, the 1958 midterm, which is one of the great midterm waves ever, it actually Help set up the Democrats for some of their legislative victories in the 60s because they did so well in the 1958 midterm, which was Dwight Eisenhower's second midterm as president. There was a horrible recession in late 1957, early 1958. And yes, it sort of the, the numbers kind of improved, but um, not fast enough and not noticeably enough for people to, you know, to, to, to go back to the Republicans and the Democrats won these, this huge wave. And, you know, there's some debate amongst people who really follow this stuff as to whether maybe people's opinions of the economy do kind of update as as things get you know move along that they don't necessarily just bake things in earlier in the year you know with the swap out of Harris at the top of the ticket um it seems like you know the democrats are maybe in a, a little bit better position on the economy although trump generally still has advantages on that issue um i guess one positive thing for democrats is that people aren't just voting on their perceptions of the economy they're voting on all sorts of things i think our elections have increasingly become kind of more cultural than sort of economic based in you know in recent election years uh, again if if people were just voting on stewardship of the economy i think trump would probably have a clear edge and yet i don't think trump has a clear edge and so it, it stands to reason there are other things going into that uh, evaluation. So then what's going to be the key to the remaining voting blocks that, that are still undecided here? What are the issues that they still need more clarity on from the Trump administration and from uh, the, the Harris administration? There's still some uh, folks who are saying that maybe they don't know quite enough about Harris and her policies. You know, this is there's this ongoing discussion as to whether Harris has been too buttoned up, whether Tim Walls has been too buttoned up. Uh, and whether they should be doing more media, you know, ultimately, is that really going to decide things? And, you know, I guess in a, in a close election, all sorts of things could contribute to to the uh, to the outcome. I, I think Harris at this point would probably love to have another debate. Uh, it doesn't seem like Donald Trump really wants to do that. And I don't blame him for that because I do think he was I, I do think he basically lost the first debate. Um, not that again, not that it necessarily changed the numbers uh, all that all that much. But, you know, one of these things that I think happens with Trump is that 
when people are really focused on him and really focused on his warts, I do think he tends to sort of sag and have trouble. Um, but if there's no debate and there's nothing to bring people's attention back to Trump over the last month of the election, could that just allow his support to sort of, you know, just just increase slightly enough to get him over the finish line here? If I was on the Democratic side, I'd be worried about that, that just the, the sort of laser focus on Trump would sort of would sort of fade a little bit. And and maybe people would be thinking a little bit more about their questions about Harris or not liking Biden or those sorts of things. Um, so that's just something something I'm watching. And when we talk about October surprises, like maybe nothing happens over the course of the next month. <laughs> we just have a sort of normal campaign. Uh, and, you know, frankly, the last several weeks of 2016, uh, I think there was more of a focus on Clinton than on Trump. I think that was ultimately helpful to Trump. Yeah. Um, you know, after um, after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade last year, uh, th there was this belief that this was just going to create a huge tailwind for Democrats in uh, 2024 and perhaps after 2024 uh, with women voters. And now we even have a female candidate at the top of the ticket. But that that um, huge tailwind doesn't seem to be there or it's it's not showing up decisively in polling did uh is it there or did did this line was this line of thinking just kind of wrong a year ago uh well look the, the democrats have are closer to the median voter on on abortion rights particularly since um roe v wade went away and we had these robust federal protections for abortion rights that no longer exist um i do think that's clearly an issue the democrats are winning on it's not the only issue uh, and, and, uh, you know, you're going to have a number of states have uh, statewide ballot issues on abortion rights this year, you know, in places like Arizona, Nevada, and Florida, um, those abortion rights issues are going to perform better than the democratic candidates do in those states. Uh, and we see this all the time with ballot issues that there are certain positions that the parties hold that are more popular than the parties themselves in, in these states. Uh, I don't want to downplay the importance of the abortion rights issue. I do think it's important. I do think it's motivating for a lot of people. And again, it's an issue where the Democrats are clearly closer to the public. You see that in how the parties communicate on this issue. The Republicans are clearly on the defensive about it. You know, J.D. Vance was trying to sand down the party's uh, rough edges on this issue uh, during the debate earlier this week. Um, but uh, uh, so, you know, that's an issue where Democrats have advantage, Republicans have advantages on other issues. Real quick, Kyle, before we go, you're almost out of time, but um, I'd love to get your quick take on the on the, the on Congress, the Senate and the House. You know, is there any chance for Democrats to kind of come back in the Senate the way your ratings have them, have them down, especially in Montana and the long shot states as well as the House? What's your sense there? Uh, I do think that, the you know, of all three categories of races, you know, House, Senate, President, the likeliest outcome of all of the possibilities is Republicans win the Senate. Uh, that said, you know, the Democrats are trying to see if they can they could sneak an upset in Texas or Florida, something like that, to try to make up for Montana, which which seems kind of uphill for Democrats at this point. Um, so I, I again, I do think the Republicans are still favored in the Senate. I think the House probably would break the way of the presidential race, uh, although there is, the, you know, the House is close enough that you could see sort of, you know, maybe, you know, Democrats win the House, but Trump narrowly wins the presidency. Um, but, you know, of course, you, of the two chambers, you'd rather have the Senate, particularly for the presidential party, because you're trying to get justices confirmed. You're trying to get cabinet officials confirmed. And, you know, you can imagine there right. being some real gridlock there. If it's a Republican Senate and Harris is president. Certainly looking like a close one at the moment. Appreciate you taking the time to join us. Kyle Kondik, thank you so much. Thank that you, actually Kyle. does it for this episode of Capital Gains. So a big thank you from Kyle, Rick, Ben, and myself. That does it for this episode of Capital Gains. We'll see you next time.